This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 80. Coming up on Space Time, another lander successfully touches down on the asteroid Ryugu. Discovery of two, possibly three, new subatomic particles at the Large Hadron Collider. And intergalactic stars flying towards the Milky Way. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Japan's Hayabusa 2 spacecraft has successfully deployed a third lander onto the rugged boulder-strewn surface of the asteroid Ryugu. Jointly developed by the German and French space agencies, the 10kg mobile asteroid surface scout, or MASCOT, collected images and data on Ryugu's composition and geology. MASCOT was ejected from the Hayabusa 2 orbiter at an altitude of 51 metres, descending in a slow-motion freefall to the surface, touching down some 20 minutes later. Its successful deployment came just days after Hayabusa 2 dropped off two biscuit tin sized probes known as Micro-Nano-Experimental Robot Vehicles for Asteroids, or MINERVA 21A and 21B. But unlike the Minerva probes, which are still scampering around the 150 metre wide asteroid, Mascot was only designed for a brief 16 hour lifespan. Still, it managed to continue operating for 17 hours, hopping across the surface collecting new data before its batteries finally ran out. After its initial automated reorientation hop, Mascot ended up in an unfavourable position. Mission managers then commanded another hopping manoeuvre, placing the rover in a more favourable position using its swing arm for momentum and positioning. From its new position, MASCOT successfully completed a measurement sequence using all its instruments over one asteroid day and an asteroid night. Scientists also recorded image sequences using its onboard camera, which will be used to generate stereo images of the surface. MASCOT then moved several metres to a new monitoring position to continue its scientific mission. Finally, and seeing that the lander rover still had some battery power left, researchers undertook a much bigger jump to a new location – In addition to the images, a radiometer, a magnetometer and a spectrometer aboard Mascot provided measurements on temperature, magnetic properties and the composition of the regolith. With each Ryugu day lasting 7 hours and 36 minutes, mission managers in Cologne, Germany were able to see the sun set three times during Mascot's mission. They say all of Mascot's data was successfully uploaded to the Hayabusa 2 mothership as planned before its mission end. Hayabusa 2 then returned to its parking orbit at an altitude of 20 kilometres above the asteroid surface. The Hayabusa 2 mission was launched aboard a Japanese H-2A rocket from the Tanegashima Space Centre south of Tokyo on December 3, 2014, arriving at the near-Earth object asteroid Ryugu some 300 million kilometres away in June 2018. The 609 kilogram spacecraft is spending 18 months studying the asteroid's chemical composition, structure, early history and evolution. The probes carry multiple scientific payload instruments designed for remote sensing and sampling, including optical navigation cameras, a near-infrared spectrometer, a LiDAR light detection and ranging instrument, a thermal infrared imager and laser rangefinders. And of course, Hayabusa 2 is also transporting four lander rovers designed to investigate the asteroid surface. As well as mascot, there are the three one-kilogram hockey puck-shaped rovers known as Minervas. With Minerva 21A and 1B successfully deployed prior to mascot's descent, only Minerva 22 is yet to be deployed, and that won't happen until next year. By the way, in case we were wondering, there was an original Minerva 1. It flew aboard Japan's first asteroid sample return mission, Hayabusa. However, Hayabusa failed to carry out its full mission to the asteroid 25143 at Akawa. The Minerva 1 probe failed to land on the 350 metre wide potato shaped asteroid, instead, going to orbit around the Sun. And the Hayabusa mothership also experienced problems, failing to collect the samples expected, instead, only managing to gather up some asteroid dust. But the dust was successfully returned to Earth, being ejected in a sample return capsule, which successfully parachuted down into the Woomera rocket range in outback South Australia in 2010. Needless to say, JAXA, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, is hoping for better things with Hayabusa 2. 
Towards the end of its mission, it'll use high explosives to fire a 2kg copper impactor into Ryugu as a small deployable camera called DCAM-3 is released from the mothership to collect imagery of the impact from a distance of about a kilometre. During the impact sequence, the Hayabusa 2 mothership itself will retreat to the far side of the asteroid to protect it from any debris as the impactor slams into the surface, producing a crater. After all the dust has settled, Hayabusa 2 will then return to the impact site, drop down to the asteroid surface and collect ejected debris blown out from below the crust. Scientists believe that by getting debris from below the crust, it's less likely to be exposed to the some 4.6 billion years of contamination that material on the surface would have been subjected to. The orbit is then scheduled to depart Ryugu in December 2019, swooping past the Earth a year later, where it will eject its sample return capsule, which is designed like its predecessor, to parachute down into the warmer rocket range. 162173 Ryugu is a potentially hazardous Neo or near Earth object belonging to the Apollo group of Earth crossing asteroids. The 950 metre wide diamond shaped space rock is a rare type of asteroid known as a spectral type CG. That means it includes properties of both common carbonaceous or high carbon C type asteroids and relatively rare G-type asteroids, which contain strong ultraviolet absorption lines, suggesting phyllosilicate minerals such as clays or mica. Ryugu orbits the Sun in retrograde at a distance of between 0.96 and 1.41 astronomical units, with a Ryugu year lasting approximately 474 Earth days. By the way, an astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, about 150 million kilometres or 8.3 light minutes. The name Ryugu means Dragon Palace in Japanese, and it refers to a magical underwater palace in Japanese folklore, where a fisherman travelled to on the back of a turtle, returning home later with a mysterious box, much like Hayabusa 2, returning with asteroid samples. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Some of our existing theories about neutron stars have taken a blow, with astronomers detecting radio jets being emitted from a neutron star with a strong magnetic field. The findings reported in the journal Nature aren't predicted by current theory. Researchers observed the object, known as Swift J02436 plus 6124, using the Very Large Array Telescope in New Mexico and NASA's Swift Space Telescope. Neutron stars are the collapsed, super-dense cores of stars far more massive than the Sun, which have gone supernova at the end of their lives. One of the study's authors, Associate Professor James Miller-Jones from the Curtin University node of the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research, says the stellar collapse causes the star's magnetic field to increase in strength to several trillion times that of our Sun, which then gradually weakens again over hundreds of thousands of years. Now, many neutron stars are in binary systems with a companion star, and often material from the companion star is gravitationally drawn onto the neutron star, producing spectacular displays as some of the material is blasted out in powerful jets travelling at close to the speed of light. Astronomers have known about these jets for decades, but until now, they've only observed them coming from neutron stars with very weak magnetic fields. The prevailing idea being that a sufficiently strong magnetic field would prevent material getting close enough to a neutron star to form the jets in the first place. Weak jets belonging to neutron stars only become bright enough to see when the star's consuming gas from a companion at a very high rate. And that's where SWIFT J02436 plus 6124 comes in. Its magnetic field's about 10 trillion times stronger than that of our own sun. So, astronomers were really surprised to see a jet coming from a neutron star with such a strong magnetic field. The discovery could be revealing a whole new class of jet-producing neutron stars for study. Astronomers like to study these jets to better understand what causes them and how much power they release into space. Bill Jones says these jets play an important role in returning the huge amounts of gravitational energy extracted by neutron stars back into the surrounding environment. He says finding jets from a neutron star with a strong magnetic field goes against what's expected. And it shows there's still a lot science still doesn't know about how these jets are produced. We see jets throughout the universe. We see them in any place where uh, matter is falling onto a, a dense central object with a strong gravitational pull. So we see them from black holes, we see them from neutron stars, 
We've seen them from white dwarfs in the past as well. We even see them around newly forming young stars. The one class of compact central objects that hadn't been seen to launch jets until now were neutron stars with very strong magnetic fields. And by very strong, I mean something like a trillion times the magnetic field strength that our sun has. Magnetars indeed have very, very strong magnetic fields, usually 100 trillion times uh, that of the sun. But typically when we see magnetars, they're single isolated pulsars. Whereas the kind of neutron star we were looking at, it's a, a relatively young neutron star in a, in a binary system. So it's in a, about a 27-day orbit with a, another a more massive star. And this is a, a class of system that we call a high-mass X-ray binary. So we have a neutron star accreting from a, a, a high-mass companion star. So in this case, the companion star is spinning fairly rapidly. And that rapid rotation flings some of the material from the the companion star off around its equator. And the neutron star passes through that disk of material once every orbit. And it picks some of it up uh, and that collects up in a disk around the neutron star. And eventually when enough material is built up in the disk, it all starts flowing inwards towards the neutron star itself. When we see this kind of thing happening in neutron stars with weaker magnetic fields, we see them launching jets when they start accreting at a high rate and mass falls into them very quickly. They launch some of that material outwards in jets that we can see in radio waves. In this case, however, the magnetic field strength of the neutron star is so strong that we think it should disrupt that disk of inflowing matter and prevent it from getting close enough to the neutron star for jets to be able to form. And over the last you know, few decades, all radio observations of neutron stars with strong magnetic fields had drawn a blank. They've not seen any radio emission that would been characteristic of jets. But by looking at this particular system, which was accreting at a particularly high rate above the theoretical maximum limit at which material can actually fall onto a central body, because it was accreting at such a high rate, and because we were looking with the upgraded sensitivity of the Carl G. Jansky Very Large Array in New Mexico, uh, we were able to see a faint jet uh, for the first time in, in radio waves. Uh, and so that's very exciting, because it means we have to go back to our theories and say, how can this jet be launched after all, something about the launching of jets that we thought we understood is no longer valid. Uh, and so now we need to reconsider our theories and, and ask ourselves, how can such a strongly magnetized neutron star launch these jets out into space that carry matter and energy away to, to many light years away from, from the central neutron star? When we look at neutron stars, pulsars, even black holes, and, and we see these powerful energy beams streaming out from them, how are they launched? So there are two main theories for how you launch jets. Jets are, are these beams of, of matter and radiation that are, are coming outwards from the central object. It's not quite the same as pulsars. Pulsars are where you have this rapidly spinning neutron star. It's not accreting material matter is not falling onto it when it does that sort of short circuit the pulsar emission mechanism but it is rapidly rotating and the production of electrons relatively close to the magnetic poles leads to the radiation that we see as, as the pulsations of a pulsar um, so this system is it's not a classical radio pulsar it was seen to be pulsating in the x-rays as the magnetic field channeled material onto the magnetic poles giving off large amounts of x-ray radiation as, as they hit the neutron star surface so this is more like a, a, a neutron star version of a quasar? Yes, so a, a quasar indeed. Most of the radiation is produced from the, the accretion flow and the jets that, that come out of it. Um, and that's what we see in these scaled down systems, these X-ray binaries. And uh, we see black hole versions and neutron star versions. Uh, and both in both cases, they, they can produce jets. But it was thought that the jets were produced or could be produced in slightly different ways. Uh, so for a black hole, there's a mechanism whereby if the event horizon of the black hole is threaded by magnetic field lines, it's possible to extract some of the rotational energy of the black hole and convert that into, you know, outflowing energy that basically powers the jets. That, that's one mechanism that, that was thought to, to work for black holes. Um, for neutron stars, on the other hand, because they don't have an event horizon, it was thought that the jets from, from those systems would be launched from the disk of material flowing around them. So uh, if magnetic field lines uh, in the disk, they, they get twisted up at some level. So you can think of it a bit like if you put some beads on a wire and whirl the wire around above your head, the beads will get flung outward along the wire um, just because of the forces involved. So similarly, if you put charged particles on magnetic field lines, and whirl those around in the inner parts of the disk, 
that can send the particles flying outwards, and that is eventually channeled into these jets. So that was thought to be how you could launch jets from a neutron star. The trouble is that when the magnetic field strength is too strong, it stops the disk from getting close enough into the neutron star for this mechanism to be able to work. So we think that there has to be another another mechanism that is launching these jets. Now, some recent theoretical work has suggested that it might be possible to extract some of the rotational energy of the neutron star to power the jets. Something analogous to what we thought worked for black holes um, this is fairly recent work, and it'll take an, a lot more time and investigation to see if that theory holds up. But this is certainly an indication there has to be some mechanism by which we can launch jets, despite this very strong magnetic field stopping the disk getting close enough in. With the black hole, the uh, rotational energy that those magnetic field lines are, are directing the beams perpendicular to the accretion disk. That's right, that's right. And we think that happens in the, in the neutron star as well. Right. But, well, there could be a misalignment between the magnetic fields and the accretion disk, of course particularly for a young system like this. So as, as material falls onto a black hole or a neutron star, that body, the black hole, the neutron star, gains angular momentum and, and will eventually, over a long enough period of time, its rotation will align with binary orbit from which it's gaining all the, all the material. But a system like the one that we're studying, it's young enough that that alignment might not have taken place yet. So it's possible that the, the magnetic field could be slightly misaligned from the, from the binary orbital plane. We don't have any information on exactly you know, what direction the jets are coming out in. We didn't directly resolve them on the sky, but because we detected the strong radio emission from the system, we knew that they were there. I take it all that means also that the orbital plane of the neutron star and its binary partner doesn't necessarily have to be associated with the rotational spin of the neutron star or its binary partner. That's right. So you form a neutron star in a supernova explosion, and when that, that explosion happens, it can give the system a bit of a kick, which can push everything out of alignment. And so when, when the system's relatively young, the, the spin of the neutron star can be misaligned with the orbital plane of the two stars. And as I said, over a long enough period of time as the neutron star gains material and angular momentum from the companion, that brings the two into alignment. Um, but that takes a very long time, millions of years. And this particular system, because it's got this high mass uh, companion, we think it has to be relatively young. And so it, there's a good chance that it hasn't been aligned as yet and there could be a misalignment between the, the neutron star spin and the, and the binary plane. Looking at the name of the system, it, I take it it's in the northern celestial sphere. How far away is it? So we think it's something of order 21,000 light years or so. It was measured fairly accurately by the Gaia satellite because the companion star is so big and bright, it can be seen in the optical band. And the Gaia satellite launched by the European Space Agency has recently um, released a data Sick, from its yeah. first two years of the mission yeah, yeah. Um, that measured the, the distances to and the motions of about a billion stars in, in the galaxy, and this was one of them. So we have a very accurate distance to it. This was a relatively nearby system. It's only within our own galaxy. Do we know much about neutron stars? I mean, we know how they're made, but a lot of it's hypothesis, isn't it? <laughs> so um, they've been extremely well studied um, because we can make incredibly accurate measurements using pulsar time. So the neutron stars that are, are not accreting, but that are rotating, you know, once every a few hundredths of a second up to you know maybe a few tens of seconds and those once every rotation you see a beam of radio waves that, that's what makes a pulsar mm -hmm. and we can time the arrival of the pulses incredibly precisely that allows us to learn a huge amount about about neutron stars we don't know exactly what they're made of there are lots of hypotheses because they're so dense they are that like a scaled up atomic nucleus. But the density inside a neutron star is similar to that inside an atomic nucleus. It's incredibly high. Um, and we don't know how matter behaves under those circumstances. So neutron stars are a great way of testing this. And there are a lot of theories that say what could the, the behavior of matter be like under those incredible densities and incredible pressures. And by making very precise measurements of the masses and radii of neutron stars, we can then learn about how matter behaves on those, you know, at those extreme densities. And that's a very active area of astrophysics at the moment. We don't have the answer yet. These are very difficult measurements to make with, with high, high precision being necessary. But gradually over time, we're, we're learning more and more and, and ruling out large areas of, of parameter space. So yeah, they're fascinating objects and, and they certainly have a lot to teach us. You were able to describe the mechanism by which the radio jet was produced by the neutron star and its binary companion. What about when you look at a straightforward pulsar? How is the beam produced by the pulsar actually produced? That is a million dollar question. <laughs> There's almost certainly a Nobel Prize involved. Um, 
So, yeah, people have been studying pulsars uh, since their discovery, what, 50, 50 odd years ago. And yet, we still don't know exactly how it's produced. I mean, we know that so the magnetic fields of the pulsar, they, they come out of the pulsar's magnetic poles. We have magnetic field lines coming, coming out of one magnetic pole of the pulsar, curving around and going into the other one. And particles constrained to move along those field lines will therefore be moving along a curved path, but be accelerating, which makes them give off radiation. Exactly how that process happens is still debated. And there are all sorts of interesting measurements in terms of you know, how the, the pulse, the time arrival of the pulse varies with individual pulse number and, and so on. That tell us that it's, it's, it's a bit more complicated than that. And there are all sorts of models involving you know, sparks close to the surface and, and, and a rotating carousel, if you like, of these sparks that are producing the pulsations. But you know, there's still an awful lot of debate about exactly how that process works. And I don't think we've got to the bottom of it yet. There are a lot of people working on it and some of the new generation of radio telescopes being built and used to study pulsars can, can shed a little bit of new light on this, looking over a whole range of frequencies, looking with high sensitivity, all of these sorts of things. So I think hopefully we will learn more in the coming years, but not a question that, that we can give a definitive answer to at the moment. That's Associate Professor James Miller-Jones from the Curtin University node of the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research. And I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. Physicists have discovered two new subatomic particles with hints of a possible third. The findings, reported on the pre-press physics website archive.org and published in the journal Physical Review Letters and the European Physical Journal C, were discovered during high-energy proton collisions at the LHCB experiment on the Large Hadron Collider, the world's largest atom smasher. The newly discovered particles, named Sigma Beauty 6097 Plus and Sigma Beauty 6097 Minus, are baryons, particles made up of three quarks. They therefore belong to the same family of particles as the protons and neutrons which make up the nucleus of atoms. Quarks are elemental subatomic particles and a fundamental constituent of matter. They combine to form composite particles called hadrons, the most stable of which are protons and neutrons. Due to a phenomenon known as colour confinement, quarks are never directly observed or found in isolation. Instead, they're only found in hadrons, which coexist as either baryons, such as protons and neutrons, or as mesons, which are made up of quark-antiquark pairs. Quarks have various intrinsic properties, including electric charge, mass, colour charge and spin. And they're the only elementary particle in the standard model of particle physics to experience all four fundamental forces, electromagnetism, gravity and both the strong and weak nuclear forces. There are six known types of quarks, known as flavours. Up, down, top, bottom, sometimes called beauty, and charm and strange. The up and down quarks are the most common and they have the lowest masses. The proton is composed of two up quarks and a down quark, while the neutron is made up of one up quark and two down quarks. The other four types of quarks, the top, bottom, charm and strange, are heavier and so rapidly change into up and down quarks through a process of particle decay a transformation from a higher mass state into a lower mass state. Because of all this, up and down quarks are generally stable and the most common type of quark in the universe, whereas strange, charm, top and bottom quarks can only be produced in high energy collisions, such as those involving cosmic rays or in particle accelerators. And just to keep things even more complicated, for every quark flavour, there's a corresponding antimatter counterpart or antiquark that differs only in that some of its properties have equal magnitude but opposite sign. What makes the newly discovered particles at the Large Hadron Collider so interesting is that they contain two up quarks and a bottom quark, or two down quarks and a bottom quark, and consequently they're now being referred to as bottom baryons. The 6097 in their names refers to the estimated masses the new particles have in mega electron volts, which in the world of particle physics are both a unit of energy and of mass. What all this means is that these two new particles have about six times the mass of a proton. But the story doesn't end there. The authors have also found signs of a third yet to be confirmed particle. Tentatively named ZC-4100, this appears to be a different type of baryon, comprising four quarks rather than the usual two or three. Physicists are equating it to a sort of double meson with two quarks and two antiquarks, and the two quarks are both thought to be heavy charm quarks. Hints of these exotic mesons have come up before, often described in scientific papers as tetraquarks as well as five-quark particles called pentaquarks. 
In fact, we've reported on both types, both in space-time and its predecessor, Star Stuff. The Large Hadron Collider, or LHC, is located at CERN, the European Organisation for Nuclear Research. It's a 27-kilometre circumference ring buried 100 metres underground below the Franco-Swiss border near Geneva. The LHC is part of a large complex of particle accelerators, synchrotrons and other high-energy laboratories. The ring itself includes four massive detectors called ATLAS, ALICE, CMS and LHCB, each located in its own huge underground cavern. Packets of protons or other subatomic particles are accelerated around the LHC to within 99.999 repeat percent the speed of light. They're fired in opposite directions in two particle beamlines around the ring, guided by cryogenically cooled superconducting magnets. The beamlines are designed to intersect at any of the four detectors, colliding the particle packets at up to 13 tera-electron volts, and creating the sorts of conditions, pressures and temperatures that existed in the moments after the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered dozens of stars flying through intergalactic space heading towards the Milky Way galaxy. The findings, reported in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, show that as well as hypervelocity stars being flung out of the Milky Way through close gravitational encounters with the galaxy's supermassive black hole Sagittarius A star, stars are also being flung towards it, perhaps from other galaxies. Astronomers made the discovery using observations from the second data release from the European Space Agency's Gaia mission. Stars circle around our galaxy at hundreds of kilometres per second, and their motions contain a wealth of information about the past history of the galaxy. The fastest of these stars are called hypervelocity stars. They're thought to start their lives near the galactic centre, later being flung towards the edge of the Milky Way through gravitational interactions with Sagittarius A star. Only a small number of hypervelocity stars have so far been discovered, and Gaia's latest data release provides a unique opportunity for astronomers to look for more. One of the study's authors, Alina Maria Rossi from Leiden University, says that of the 7 million Gaia stars with full three-dimensional velocity measurements, her team found 20 that appear to be travelling fast enough to eventually escape from the Milky Way. However, Rossi and colleagues were surprised to discover that rather than flying away from the galactic centre, most of these newly found high-velocity stars seem to be racing towards it. They're hypothesising that these could be stars from other galaxies which are zooming through the Milky Way. Rossi suggests it's possible that these intergalactic interlopers could be coming from the Large Magellanic Cloud, a relatively small nearby galaxy thought to be orbiting the Milky Way. Or they could originate from other, more distant galaxies. Either way, they're carrying information about their original host galaxies, and studying them at much closer distances than their parent galaxies could provide astronomers with unprecedented information about the nature of stars in other galaxies. Because stars can be accelerated to high velocities by interactions with supermassive black holes, the presence of these stars might tell us something about the supermassive black holes at the centres of these nearby galaxies. But the thing is, stars can also be flung out of their original orbits if they're in a binary system in which the other star in the system is exploded as a supernova. Either way, studying them could tell us more about these kinds of processes in other galaxies. Of course, there's always the possibility that these newly identified hypervelocity stars could be native to our own Milky Way galaxy halo. That's a region surrounding the Milky Way composed of mostly ancient stars. And gravitational tidal interactions with nearby dwarf galaxies such as the Magellanic Clouds could fling them towards the galactic centre. Additional information about the age and composition of these stars will help astronomers clarify their origins. At least two more Gaia data releases are planned for the 2020s, and each will provide both new and more precise information on a larger set of stars. Scientists eventually expect full three-dimensional velocity measurements for up to 150 million stars, hopefully helping astronomers identify hundreds of thousands of hypervelocity stars, understanding their origin in much more detail, and then using them to investigate the history of our own galaxy. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. Russia has been widely condemned and described as a pariah state over a series of cybersecurity attacks, including one targeting the chemical weapons watchdog, the OPCW. 
Dutch, Australian, American, British, Canadian and New Zealand governments are among the many nations slamming Vladimir Putin and his military spy agency, the GRU, after a series of clandestine attacks were exposed. In the past week, the Netherlands have expelled four GRU agents from the Sandworm Cybercrime Unit after they were caught red-handed carrying out cyber attacks at the headquarters of the OPCW. And what a coincidence, the chemical weapons watchdog had been investigating both the fatal Salisbury Novichok nerve agent attack, which attempted to assassinate Sergei Skripal and his daughter, as well as chemical weapons attacks which have killed hundreds of civilians in Syria. And it doesn't end there. After confiscating their equipment, Dutch counter-espionage officers discovered data on one of the Russian spies' computers showing the same GRU team had previously travelled to Malaysia to attempt to hack the investigation into Malaysia Airlines flight MH17, which was shot down by a Russian surface-to-air missile, killing all 288 people on board. And it gets even better. The same GAU team also travelled to Switzerland during the World Anti-Doping Agency conference, immediately following the banning of Russian athletes for using performance-enhancing drugs, and where officials from the International Olympic Committee and the Canadian Centre for Ethics in Sport became victims of a cyber attack. The computer data shows the GAU team also travelled to Brazil, and they tried to hack into the UK Foreign Office in March and the Port and Down Chemical Weapons Facility in April. The British ambassador to the Netherlands, Peter Wilson, says it was all part of an aggressive cyber campaign by the GRU trying to clean up Russia's own mess. The US government has also laid criminal charges against the GRU hackers over allegations of computer hacking, wire fraud, aggravated identity theft and money laundering to promote Russian interests by nefarious means. The GRU team are also charged along with three of their colleagues with being part of the Fancy Bears group that hacked anti-doping authorities and leaked records of athletes at a time when the Russians were facing allegations of state-sponsored cheating. The Russian government, for its part, has rejected all the claims. A new report into drug trends by the University of New South Wales has found a shift among users towards higher purity types of ecstasy, crystal methamphetamine and cocaine. The study also found psychostimulants are having a worrying effect on the health of some users, especially young ones, with one in five of all fatal strokes among young adults now involving drug users. See, the thing is, strokes are rare among young people, but the average age of these psychostimulant users was just 37. Australia has recorded its dry September on record, with less than a third of the nation's usual rainfall for the month. The new data from the Bureau of Meteorology indicates below average rainfall covered almost the entire country last month and was only just beaten by April 1902 as the driest month ever recorded. September also scored average temperatures 1.41 degrees above the average for the entire 1961-90 to period. New figures from the Australian Bureau of Statistics show that mobile wireless broadband connections are continuing to advance as Australia's most popular means of accessing the internet. As of June 30th, there were 6.56 million mobile wireless internet subscribers. That compares to 3.6 million with fibre connections and 3.2 million connecting through DSL phone services. Overall, there are some 14.7 million internet subscribers. That's up 3.6% since the end of last year. And the rate of downloads is also continuing to climb, up 28% on the previous year. Meanwhile, the ABS has also found there are now around 937,000 cable subscribers, 217,000 people using fixed wireless services, and 132,000 satellite-based subscribers. The heir to the British throne, Prince Charles, has given artificial intelligence the thumbs down. The 69-year-old future king says he's concerned about the way artificial intelligence is beginning to change the way people interact with machines. With the details, we're joined by Alex Sahar of Reut from ITY. He said back in 2003 that he likes to instruct his plants on how to grow. I was reading about that in the Daily Mail. But um, he yeah. has warned that um, you know the, the problem is that man and machine are uh, not meant to be... You know, together, he reckons it's dangerous. He warns that crazy AI world of part machine, part human is just dangerous. Prince Charles said that the thing he finds hardest to cope now is with this extraordinary trend, he says, that somehow we must become part human, part machine. You know, already experts have come out saying that um, he's warning about uh, crazy AI is misguided. But he's he, not the he, only one, is he? There are uh, many prominent people, including scientists, who have raised concerns about where AI is heading 
next. Look, we only have to look at science fiction movies, The Terminator and uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey and others where technology goes bad. We've all seen technology have problems in our own lives today. And we started to think what would happen if there was some sort of super intelligent AI that just decided that humans were not necessary. That report by Alex Sahar of Reut from IT Wire. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice weekly podcast through Apple Podcast, iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from Space Time with Stuart Gary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast to coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.